We're so glad that you're here. Today is the third week in Advent. We're only two weeks away from Christmas. Uh, the third week of Advent is all about joy. We're going to talk about joy today. Joy, and you know when joy comes? Joy comes when there is good news. I love hearing good news. I love hearing good news. We all love to hear good news. And... Uh, when something good happens in our life, we want to tell somebody else about it. Now, I, I, I was thinking about this a little bit the other day. Where do people on the internet share good news? Obviously, Facebook they do, but there's this, this website that I've heard about a lot lately. Maybe some of you have heard of this website. It's called Pinterest. Anybody heard of Pinterest before? Two of you. Awesome. That's great. So here's what I found about Pinterest. Pinterest, one article said Pinterest is the world's catalog of ideas. Another article stated that Pinterest is a virtual inspiration board that can help you hack your way through throwing an amazing party. I'm just telling you, if you come to a party I throw, we're not going to hack through anything except pizza boxes. That's all we're going to hack through. Hack through uh, uh, how to, to throw an amazing party, feeding your family, creating a new look for yourself, and even decorating your home. And I think what Pinterest is all about is this, that people have discovered such practical solutions to some very basic problems that we have in life. So I went to Pinterest the other day. I thought, i got to find out for myself, what is Pinterest all about? Well, first of all, you can't just go look at Pinterest. You've got to register to be a user at Pinterest. So they want username, password, all that kind of stuff. So you set up an account. And uh, just, guys, just don't tune me out yet. Just so you know, I'm being honest with you here. And this is being recorded for television, too, by the way. I deactivated my Pinterest account after I found out that it was just, for me, uh, personally, kind of boring. But anyway, a lot of people have found some great ideas. And they, they find ideas to accomplish things, and then they post them, or they pin them in Pinterest. So if you've never been to Pinterest, that's what I learned about Pinterest. And I, I think why it has caught on so much is because people have found they found solutions. They want to tell somebody. They want to share their news with somebody. And I think all of us are a little bit the same. When something good happens to us, when we hear good news, we want to tell somebody else about it. Today is the Good News Sunday in the Advent calendar. So whenever, uh, maybe you've been walking around somewhere and you found some money laying on the ground. I mean, even if it's a dollar, you'll tell somebody about it. You'll for sure tell people about it. If it's a 20 or a 50, if it's a hundred dollars, you don't tell anybody because you don't want them going back to where you found a hundred bucks because they might find it there. But you tell somebody when something good happens to you in your life. When somebody gets engaged, we want to tell people that, hey, they're engaged, they're about to get married. When somebody becomes pregnant or when there's a birth, we love to tell, we love to tell. It's just news so delicious. We can't even talk about it. Now, most of the men in here have just tuned me out. They're going, pastor, I don't do Pinterest. I don't tell people about pregnancies, and I don't talk to people about engagements, all that kind of stuff. No, you know what you do? I've seen you at breakfasts and meals. You pass around your phone, and there's a picture of you next to a dead animal with big antlers out of the top of it. That's what you do. And you're all probably, yeah, it's an eight point, it's a ten point, whatever the whole kind of thing, and talking about the measurement of span across there. If you want to impress this pastor, take a picture of yourself with that animal before you kill it. I'll be really impressed, all right? So even guys like to talk about the good things that are going on in their life. Good news, news so good that we just can't hold on to it ourselves. And I think that's the message of Christmas. That there's a message in Christmas that's so good that we can't possess it to all of ourselves. It's a message of hope. It's a message of salvation. It's a message of the faithfulness of God. It's a message that there's encouraging things in the midst of desperate things. That's the message of Christmas. We know the Christmas story. We know the Christmas story. It's a story of good news. And good news fell into a world when Jesus came. It was emotionally dark, spiritually dark, politically dark. A lot like the world that we live in today. And in the midst of that atmosphere, God invaded history through the birth of Jesus Christ that would bring hope. You know this part of the story. In Luke chapter 2, you know this part. In Luke chapter 2, verse number 8. That that night, the night of the day or whatever time of day Jesus was born, that that night there were some shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. They're nearby Bethlehem. Shepherds, the unlovely people. <laughs> I don't know if you've been around sheep very much. They don't smell good. 
And the shepherds were not necessarily warmly welcomed into the village. They were ordinary people, unlovely people perhaps, ceremonially unclean people. And to the shepherds, to the shepherds that were watching their flocks outside of the little tiny burb of Bethlehem, an event happens that we know so well in verse 9, suddenly, Suddenly an angel, just one angel, one angel, suddenly just one at the beginning, an angel of the Lord appeared amongst all of those shepherds, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. Can you imagine the darkness around Bethlehem? There's no street lights. I would imagine the shepherds maybe kind of sitting around their campfires, perhaps roasting marshmallows and telling ghost stories. I don't know what they're doing. And in the midst of that, the supernatural luminance of God appears when that one angel shows up. I don't know how you'd respond, but uh, I think I'd respond the same way the shepherds did. Look what it says in verse number 10. They were terrified. (laughs) I bet they were. But the angel reassured them. He says this, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you, say it with me, good news that will bring great joy to a select number of people. I bring you great joy and good news to uh, a chosen few, to people who are good enough, to people who've earned the right to hear it. He says, I bring good news for all people, and you're some of those all people that the angel talked about that night. Your family is some of the all the people that the angel talked about. Your descendants are some of those people. Your offspring and generations to follow are a part of the all people that the angel talked about that night. It's good news. He goes on to say in verse number 11, here's the good news if you really want to know it. The Savior. The Savior. Yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. A Savior. A Savior from what? A Savior from the foolishness of humanity. A Savior from ourselves. A Savior that comes alongside of us when we have behaved our way into places we should never have gone. We need a Savior for that. And then he says, not just a Savior, a Messiah. Somebody who will lead if people will follow and lead them where they need to go. That's the good news. And if we would do those things, it provides for us hope. It's it's news so good that it needed to be shared. Well, I would imagine it says as we read the rest of the narrative, the shepherds, well, they went into town and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby wrapped up there. And I would imagine as soon as they could get a Wi-Fi signal, they were on Facebook right now telling everybody what they saw. (laughs) there's another story about good news found in the Old Testament I love this story it's a story that goes back into Israel's history and there's such a great principle in the story that I think applies to you and me today a story about good news Um, there was a king named Ben-Hadad he was the king of a country called Aram A-R-A-M the king of Aram Uh, he came to do war against Samaria. Samaria is uh, one of the capitals in the nation of Israel, one of the kingdoms in Israel. Now, Samaria, like uh, any of the larger cities, was a walled city. It had large walls around it, and uh, built into the walls were gates that would open, and the gates would close at night. It was uh, an act of defense for the city. Ben-Hadad decides to use one of the oldest tried and true military tactics he could use to defeat that city. He lays lays siege to the city. Siege just simply means sit. And so Ben-Hadad leads his army from Aram to Samaria. And they sit around the perimeter of the city. And they allow nobody to go in and nobody to come out. If you want to know what that would be like today, just imagine, just imagine for a moment that all inroads are closed. The airport is closed. No fuel trucks come into Williston. No food trucks come into Williston. The water supply is cut off to Williston. And if people got word of that, there would be such a scramble at the grocery stores to get whatever food was available and left. But even at that, after so many months, runs out because there's nothing left. And that's the way it was in Samaria. In fact, uh, people got so hungry, uh, they resorted to eating and bartering for the head of a donkey to eat. And if you don't think that's bad, the uh, 
They, they bartered for dove's dung. And uh, even more so, they resorted to cannibalism. The king of Samaria finds two women arguing about which of the children they're going to eat. It's how bad it got. In the midst of this story, uh, there's, there's four characters who had uh, skin disease called leprosy. <laughs> if, uh, if there was anybody in the culture of the time that was unwanted uh, in the city and in the community, it would have been a leper, an outsider, uh, maybe a little bit like a shepherd. And uh, in the midst of the story and these four lepers and uh, Samaria and all of this, Elisha the prophet is there. We, we talked about him a little bit last week. Elisha becomes the representation of God. He's the mouthpiece for God. And things got so bad in Samaria. And of course, uh, like a lot of things, when people get really angry and upset at the circumstances in their life, they first blame God for it. And that's what the people of Samaria did as well. They blamed God for the, the calamity and for the famine that's going on. But Elisha said, you just stand and watch. God's going to turn this whole thing around in an instant. You just watch and see. And maybe that's where your life is today. If you're watching online or watching at home, maybe situations are so bad in your life, you wonder, could it get any worse? And where is God in this? I'm telling you, I serve a God of miracle power that can turn our difficulties around in an instant. And you're going to see that in the story that we read. Well, uh, the story picks up in 2 Kings chapter three, or chapter 7, verse number 3. Um, there was uh, four men with leprosy, and they're, they're sitting at the entrance to one of those city gates. They have a little dialogue with each other. And they said, um, why should we just sit here waiting to die? Because that's apparently what they had been doing. They couldn't go in the city. Nobody there wanted them. And uh, outside the city gates, beyond uh, the, the, the region, there was an invading army out there. And here we sit, not knowing what to do. We're just going to sit here and die. So why should we do this? Let's do something. So in the verse number four, uh, they reasoned that, you know what, we're going to starve if we just stay here. But with the famine in the city, well, we'll starve if we go back there. So you know what, we, we might as well go out and surrender to the Aramean army. And if they let us live, well, so much the better. But if they kill us, well, we're, we're going to die anyway. How bad are your options? How bad does it get for you? And you live in the midst of a community that is looking for answers. They're waiting to hear some good news because they've run out of options. On my way to work the other day, I heard such a family like that. It was a Tuesday. Apparently, in the midst of Christmas and all the cheer and celebration that surrounds the holidays, it wasn't that way in their home, and they'd run out of options. And I heard the argument as he was apparently leaving for work, and the shouting and the screaming that went on back and forth. And, and I know they had run out of options because the last thing he said before he slammed the door to the house was, I don't know, you'll have to figure it out. And people looking for options. And they live right next door to you. They live all around you. You interact with them all the time. People who are waiting to hear good news. None of us in this room likes to hear this statement. Well, I've got good news and I've got bad news. We just want to hear good news. Just tell me the good news. Give me something to hang on to. I need to know there's hope because right now I don't feel it. I'm not experiencing it and I'm not seeing a whole lot of it. Oh, there's some people, they're going to do it their way as long as they possibly can until there is no other hope. But there's a lot of people that are at that place right now waiting to hear some hope. Well, the uh, uh, inactivity was turned to activity for these four lepers. The story goes on in verse 5. At, uh, at twilight, these four lepers, they set out for the camp of the Arameans. <laughs> they, they knew where they were camping. I mean, it was obvious they'd heard the roar of the army. They saw the smoke from the fires, and they could smell the food cooking in the pots. And whatever distance they had to travel to get there, uh, when they get sight of the camp, they get there and, and the, they came to the edge of the camp and nobody was there. <laughs> it was a little bit eerie. I mean, there's tens of thousands of soldiers surrounding our city and we get to the camp where they are, there's nobody there. The horses are there. The camels and the donkeys, they're all there. The fires are burning there. Not a soul around. Quiet. The reason, the reason there was nobody there because God had supernaturally 
intervened. Verse 6 says, The Lord had caused the Aramean army to hear the clatter of speeding chariots and the galloping of horses and the sound of a great army approaching. There was no army approaching. God just supernaturally intervened and they, they could hear this sound. Their conclusion when they heard the sound was that, well, the king of Israel has hired the Hittites and the Egyptians to attack us, and they cried out to one another. So they, they, they heard this supernatural sound that God had created and came to the conclusion that other armies are coming to conquer us, and so the story goes on in verse 7. They, they, they panicked, and they, they ran in the night, abandoning their tents, their horses, donkeys, and everything else, and they fled for their lives. I want you to understand that when, when, when armies went to battle back in those days, they brought everything with them. Even the kitchen sink. I mean, they went to battle like they were going ice fishing. They brought the TV with them. They brought the microwave with them, the game console with them, and maybe a fishing rod as well. I mean, they brought everything along with them. And so they run out of the camp, and the lepers, they discover this, this camp, and there's, there's nobody there. But all the possessions are there. Verse 8 says, when the men of leprosy Arrived at the edge of the camp, well, they, they did what you and I would do. <laughs> they, they went into uh, one tent after another. These are hungry lepers. And uh, they, they were eating and they were drinking wine and they carried off silver and gold and clothing and they, they hid it. I mean, <laughs> these guys peeled off their lottery ticket and it was the right number. It was the Powerball with the multiplier. I mean, these guys found it right there in that campground, and they're going from tent to tent having a feast and a fiesta. It was an incredible moment for these four guys. Can you imagine? Hundreds, perhaps thousands of tents across several acres, and they're just having a bonanza as they go from tent to tent having a feast and filling their aching bellies. And then if this was a movie, if this was a movie, this is, this is the way I picture it happening. <laughs> they're darting from tent to tent and they're finding all these things and they're digging holes furiously and they're folding up gold and silver in the clothes, putting in the hole, covering it back up again. And they're going from tent to tent, discovering all this treasure. And then it's as if they all ran from different tents at exactly the same time, stopped and looked at each other and had this profound aha moment. <laughs> Verse 9 says, this isn't right. I think they all looked at each other and went, whoa, 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 whoa. What are we doing here? This isn't right. This, this is a day of, say it with me, good news. I mean, we're, we're out here feasting. We're filling our aching bellies and our family, our relatives, our friends. They're all back inside Samaria starving tonight, not able to sleep because they feel the gnaw in their gut. <laughs> This is a day of good news, and, and, and we're not sharing it with, and we're not sharing it with anyone. You know, if we wait here till morning, some calamity might certainly fall upon us. I don't know if that was true or not. They're superstitious, like a lot of people. So their act, their action, based upon their revelation, was, you know what? Come on, we 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 need to go back and tell all the people at the palace. We've got good news. We've got something to tell. Can you imagine this with me for a little bit? Just, 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 let's just put on your thinking cap. Pretend with me for a moment. You're out, you're out spelunking with your friends. And believe me, spelunking is totally legal, all right? Just saying. In other words, you're looking through caves. And you're with your closest family. You're with your friends, the people that you love the most. And you're walking through this big, it is big. You can stand upright. And you're walking around in there. And you start to go further and further back in the cave. Then the rumbling of the earth. You know, you've seen this on TV, haven't you? Boulders come down, and boulders never fall in the middle of the cave. They always fall at the mouth of the cave. Suddenly, you're trapped. Screams of panic erupt in there. There's no way out. We're in a cave. There's, we'll never get out of this thing alive. And the panic begins to settle, and there's trying to be some rational ideas shared. What are we going to do? How do we get out? And some people are trying to pull big rocks aside in desperation to get out of this cave. But you, you, you've, you, you've got that 20,000 lumen flashlight that could burn the retina out of an eyeball at 10 yards, right? 
you're going to go looking through a cave. You're not bringing the Bic lighter. You're going to have a flashlight with you. And you uh, start searching in the back of the cave, back of the cave, back of the cave. And it just goes way, way back. And then as you're searching, you can smell something. It's fresh air. Well, how could fresh air get in here? There's got to be, there's got to be, there's got to be a way for fresh air to get in here. So you shut off your light. And as your eyes adjust to the darkness, you can see just a little tiny shaft of light way up high. You turn on your light again so that you can see the boulders and how you're going to traverse through those boulders and get to that little light. And you do. With your light back on again, you start to climb over rocks and up ledges and you find there's a place where you can literally pull the dirt down and the sunlight beams through a shaft into that dark spot. And what do you do? You know what you do? You climb through the hole and you go on and live the rest of your life. (laughs) You know what you would do? You'd be going berserk in the cave. Good news! Hey, I found a way out. I found freedom. We're safe. It's going to be okay. Follow me. Come on. Come on. I found a way out of here. You'd be so excited to share that news. You'd be the rock star. It would just be an amazing moment. You know what? If you have found Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you found the way. You found freedom. You found hope. Far be it from us to not share the good news with somebody else and encourage them with what we have found. We found the access point. We found the way out. We're not trapped in the darkness anymore. Let us tell other people that we found the way in. That's what it's all about, church. That's called evangelism. That's called evangelism. We found the way to freedom. If you've connected with Jesus, you found the way to freedom. Far be it from us not to tell somebody about it. Oh, pastor, I mean, I, I've never gone to Bible college. I, I don't know how to do what you're doing up there. Listen, if you're doing what I do, all you have to do is stand up here and scream. You, you can do what I'm doing up here. But you have a story to tell. You see, you're here today because somebody made an investment in you. Somebody prayed for you. <laughs> somebody invited you to church again and again and again. And they bribed you and they begged you, but they didn't give up on you. And then Jesus did something in you or wants to do something in you if he hasn't already. And it totally transformed your life and totally changed who you are. You see, if you've gone hunting and you killed the big buck, oh, there's a story behind it. Well, it was 3.30 in the morning when we first got in the truck and we drove 87 miles and then we went through over hill and over dale and we went through coolies and the temperature was 38.2 degrees and I sat at this one outlook over and you could describe the trees and I saw this herd coming through and there was one and you could tell every single detail about that hunting trip. Why can't you do that with what Jesus has done in your life? It's that easy. And there's somebody that wants to hear the encouragement of your story. You don't have to save anybody. You don't have to convert them to Christianity. All you got to do is say, I found the hope. I heard good news. And I want to tell you the good news that I discovered for myself. That's really what it's all about. You can bring the good news to people that feel despondent and desperate like the couple I heard the other morning. I had somebody go through the doors after the last service and said, uh, my wife and I fight on Thursdays, not Tuesdays, just so you know. But here, here's, here's, here's where you come into the whole thing. You have so much value. You have value in the hands of God to make a difference in somebody else's life. No special education, no special knowledge. Just obedience. 